down in Somerville and grew up mainly in West Medford, graduated from Medford High School just before Pearl Harbor and uh, just a couple of years before Pearl Harbor. And uh, when the war started with Pearl Harbor, I was working in General Electric River Works in Lynn. And uh, a friend of mine, a buddy of mine that worked there also, came in one day and told me he'd been to a Boston recruitment office and looked into getting into the Air Force. And uh, I had always been interested in airplanes. So I uh, asked if I could go in, in with him the next time he went in. We went in uh, to Conroth Avenue to a, a building, I think it was the old Packard building. And uh, they were giving tests in there including physical tests. He flunked the physical and I passed, so I went. And uh, they were expanding the Air Force at that time to the extent that they didn't have enough pilot spaces. Uh, and uh, they had to put you on leave until they could space open for you. And it wasn't until August, I, I signed up in April of 42, and it wasn't until August that I was called for cadet training. The first thing we did was leave Boston by train and go all the way across the country to Santa Ana, California, where we had pre-flight before any flying. And, uh, about uh, August uh, to uh, November, we were engaged with uh, physical training and marching and uh, taking tests and so forth. Actually, I had been up on an airplane once at Revere Airport, a small piper. And at, at age 11, I lived so close to Revere and uh, Revere Airport that I got acquainted with a pilot there who was also a mechanic and he would take engines apart and I would lug the parts over to a degreasing vat. So I thought I was a big shot then. And uh, I actually wrote to the Air Army to see how I could become a pilot at that time, and I was 11 years old. And then I forgot all about being a pilot until the war came along. In August, I went to Thunderbird Field in Arizona, right outside of uh, Phoenix. And that was a the first primary training school, which was run by civilians owned by civilians. The only military man on the base was a, a lieutenant who gave us our final check flights after flying uh, some 70 hours in uh, the Stearman biplane uh, signal engine. And uh, after graduating from primary, I went to basic training at Marana, Marana Airfield, just north of Tucson, for a flight in a low wing monoplane, single engine, and fixed gear called the Volte. And uh, after another 70 some hours there, I went to advance at Marfa, Texas, where I flew twin engine Cessna Bobcats, a low-wing uh, fixed gear aircraft. And uh, after graduation, or before graduation, they asked us to uh, state what our uh, preference was in the type of aircraft. And I was always kind of partial to the Douglas twin engine 
uh, low wing uh, attack bomber. And uh, before I got into training, I thought I was going to be lined up for that. And I went all the way up to Moses Lake by train with a bunch of other people. And uh, when we got there, we found all I had was four engine B-17s. So I went through B-17 training there and uh, later went by train to uh, Scott Field at uh, St. Louis, or just outside of St. Louis, where uh, we made up into a crew of 10 men, uh, four officers, two pilots, a, a bombardier and a navigator, plus uh, six uh, airmen that were gunners, as well as engineers. We did marching, of course, and marched to and from meals, and uh, the civilian pilots, instructors, uh, were uh, very good. Some, sometimes they'd take us to a, an auxiliary field and we'd be shooting landings there. And finally, when the instructor thought you were ready, he'd have you tack it in the middle of the field and he'd get out and tell you I was on my way. So you get your check out that way. One interesting factor on Thunderbird Field was we had a visitor one day, came up from Texas, and his name was Jimmy Stewart. And he, it turned out, had been a pilot before the war, along with many other uh, rich actors and in the movies there, including Wallace Berry. And uh, Jimmy Stewart was flying a twin engine bomber training, a Beechcraft uh, twin engine with a nose that held a bombardier, and he was to fly them for training. Later, he went overseas and was executive officer with a uh, B-24 four-engine bomber group. Some of our training hit upon firing from the, the 17 at fixed targets on the ground. And we did a lot of navigation, principally at night. And in September, we picked up an, a brand new airplane at Scott Field and went through a series of calibration of instruments uh, along with more navigation. Then uh, we headed off for Bangor, Maine and stayed overnight there, then went up to a field in Canada uh, for jumping off for uh, across the Atlantic. And we landed at Meeks Field in Iceland and we were stuck there for, I think it was 19 days because of weather between uh, Iceland and Scotland. Finally, we got going again and landed at a field just out of Glasgow. And the first thing they did was take the plane away from us for further in, in uh, th theater modifications. went by train from there to a, a pool of personnel and uh, were there about a, oh, three weeks or so when we were ordered to move to our established base at Bury St. Edmunds, which is about 30 miles east of Cambridge, England, 
in the lowlands there. And there was a spread of, of uh, about a hundred um, United States Army airfields in that area. We rented them and charged uh, the rent against Lend Lease, which kept Lend Lease figures a little smaller. And we did the same thing in leasing airports like Bermuda and other places. I went on my first mission, I think it was November 7th, 1943. And it was a long one, uh, longest of all for me, 10 and a half hours up to Norway to bomb a heavy water plant that the Germans were using to create heavy water for their atomic bomb experiments. Thankfully, we got there before they did in finalizing the development of a bomb. Thoughts mainly were of a, a mix-up of aircraft. We formed up for the first time in dead of blackness of night, and it was added to by mist and so forth at low levels. So everyone in the whole group had trouble chasing the plane ahead of them and finding the proper group uh, formation to join up with. We even had a B-24 in our formation of B-17s when the time came to leave England and head out over the North Sea there. We, uh, we bombed this place that was down in a chasm of a river and uh, winds were such that we didn't have too effective a bombing mission that day. Later, underground people in, uh, in uh, Norway there were successful in uh, sinking a, a ferry boat that the Germans were shipping this heavy water on. So they were more successful than we were. The next month, we, I went to three different bombing missions. One was uh, Kiel, up by the Kiel Canal. They had wharfs and shipping areas, plus an oil uh, storage uh, farm there. And uh, we could see the smoke coming out up through the uh, clouds in tremendous amounts. And uh, let's see, I had uh, one mission down to Bordeaux, just north of the Spanish border, where the Germans were conducting a, an advanced fighter flying school for uh, German pilots. And these were brand new pilots, fearless as can be. And uh, we took uh, a lot of hits that day. We lost a number of planes, lost some uh, right near Bordeaux. We also lost about four others, making the long trip back around the Cherbourg Peninsula to, uh, to uh, England. I had two more missions in December and, uh, of uh, 43, and then in uh, January of 44, we were scheduled for a mission to uh, Brunswick, Germany, to bomb a, an airplane plant there. And we had to abort that mission, uh, but a couple of days later, we went to the same target, and there was quite a snafu that day. Uh, after the bombers got off the ground and circled around for about an hour of, of uh, forming up, 
before leaving England, it became aware, it became evident to the people in charge that they were not going to be able to get many fighters up that day. So it has turned out they made a recall for two of the three groups. The lead group was far enough in so they allowed him to continue to his target, which was a little different target than Brunswick. And uh, we got a recall too for our group, but the lead uh, decided he was close enough to the target to uh, drop the bombs instead of bringing them back and getting credit for a bombing mission. And uh, so he decided to lead the whole group uh, over Brunswick. And on the first pass, there were cloud formations below us that made it impossible for them to lock onto the target. So he decided to make a 360 turn over the target. And the two groups uh, with us, forming the division, uh, they were able to drop and they took off and went for home. As it turned out, our group was the only one that did the 360 and went over the target second time. And we got hit very hard, especially by fighters, because they realized, of course, uh, that we were not gonna be defended very uh, well that day. And uh, we took a lot of uh, gunnery from uh, for, uh, German ME-109s flying behind us, and they would get out just outside of our range and synchronize their speeds and pepper away at us. Finally, we uh, had the left outboard engine catch fire we had to uh, feather that, shut it down. And very soon after that, we got shots right in the, in the cockpit and the fuselage of the plane. So the pilot decided we'd uh, better get out. So he called for bailout. And I followed the other two officers from the nose section, the bombardier, and navigator and uh, jumped out with any without any hesitation at all. I thought that we were perhaps over Holland because the navigator had given us a reading of 15 minutes to the channel. It turned out that we were a little short of Holland. Uh, after I got on the ground, I found that uh, I was still in Germany. I had to cross two bridges that day, that night, at, in darkness, and did that successfully. But I holed up in a haystack that, uh, all that day when, when daylight came. And in the evening, I started out walking again and I did it too soon. I had to go across the bridge, another bridge, and uh, some youngsters uh, asked me questions and when I didn't have proper answers, they made a clamor that brought uh, grown-ups right around me, including a local police. So they, the local police took me to the police station and called for a Luftwaffe, a German Air Force uh, car to come and pick me up. And about two hours later, uh, a couple of sergeants came, picked me up, and took me to their air base. The next day, uh, I went by train with about 18 other American uh, air, air that uh, had been captured that night or the night before. And we went by train down to Frankfurt to a uh, 
a facility down there where they put you in solitary confinement until they were ready to uh, uh, interview you and see if they could get more information. I was nervous and uh, a little scared when I was in that uh, solitary confinement and the, a sergeant would come in and hand out to me a, a form that he claimed was a Red Cross form and I was supposed to make it out and there were some questions on there that didn't seem to be Red Cross oriented so I refused and he got uh, appeared to be mad as can be which was all an act I guess uh, and he told me I'd never get out of there until I uh, made out that form but I think it was the next day after he said that that I was taken to the interview by an officer and shifted to uh, the holding camp down in Frankfurt because I was later in coming through they had already picked up all of my crew except the tail gunner. Unfortunately the tail gunner who was a bachelor from New Hampshire an artesian well digger he had bailed out successfully but his parachute which was a backpack uh, failed to open and uh, the irony of it was we had celebrated his 38th birthday the month before December of 43 and he could have gotten out of combat at that time if he wanted to but he had spent almost a year with us and decided he uh, wanted to stay in, uh, as part of the crew on this interrogation down at Frankfurt, uh, the interrogator told me more about the mission than I knew. Uh, as I say, I was one of the last ones of the crew that was interrogated, and he also told me the names of the ones that had been successfully picked up. And uh, so I spent uh, about three weeks in solitary there and then they moved me to a camp across town in Frankfurt uh, which was a holding camp where we got uh, Red Cross parcels with uh, spare clothing and uh, razors and combs and brush and things that we needed for personal care and I don't know what the length of time was, but about 10 days later, I think it was, we boarded a plane, over a hundred of us, and headed north to our new home. We went all the way up to the uh, Baltic Sea, and on the shore of the Baltic, at a town called Barth, Barth B-A-R-T-H, uh, we were, uh, moved into a compound there which at the time was the one compound and later became the south uh, compound of an enlarged camp. When I got there there were about 800 prisoners including some British officers because it was just being turned over as a uh, United States uh, prisoner of war camp. The British officers stayed with us and uh, as more and more prisoners came to camp it enlarged so that we had a North 1, a North 2 and finally a North 3 compound and uh, we had some famous uh, fighter aces there. Gabreski was in Francis Gabreski was our lady uh, ace in the ETO uh, in World War II. And uh, he was the senior officer in the North Compound, where I moved to from the south. 
Uh, one interesting, uh, oh, the senior officer of the whole camp, American officer, was Hubert Zemke, who was, uh, had been the group commander of the uh, 96th uh, fighter group in England, which was the most successful United States fighter group in, in Europe. And uh, Gabreski had 28 uh, victories, air victories. And uh, there were three or four others that were aces there. This was a Luftwaffe camp, all flyers, and uh, they were, there was a friendship between flyers. They never used a Nazi salute until August of 44, after the attack on Hitler's life. Then the word went out that we'd all be put under uh, more strict rules and so forth and they had to start using the Nazi salute. So the atmosphere changed a little, but not too badly. We always kept pretty busy. We did a lot of reading and drawing and studying of various uh, subjects. And of course, we, we cooked our own meal. There was a, a stand-up, stove in each room and it gave us a heat and also allowed cooking and we cooked with these briquettes of cold compressed coal dust and they were good for cooking for our foodstuffs and we uh, we take turns making different cakes and things like that And there was a lot of work to be done. Clean up the... I, I lived uh, usually in a third, third bank up. We kept uh, up with the news by virtue of uh, listening to radio, uh, German radio. And also during the nighttime, we'd have a couple of uh, hidden radios that listened to BBC and recorded everything that was in the news that had to do with the war. The next day, uh, when the uh, roving guards in the compound went out for their lunch, we'd all gather around a, a newsman in each barracks and he'd read what had been transcribed from these radios. Uh, the Germans usually were pretty accurate as to the possession of uh, ground troops, but they would use uh, harder to recognize names of cities so that we never knew when they were making a, a victory or a victorious strategic withdrawal. And we kept up with the news pretty strongly as we were interested in when we'd be freed. We had what call, you called escape, uh, escape uh, committees. And they organized different types of work to help towards escape, which never developed really. I worked on digging three tunnels and that was exciting. We had to shore up that sandy soil with all kinds of wood that we uh, got from bed boards and everything else. We kind of rough on your back when you're sleeping. <laughs> but uh, we had others that were making clothing of uniforms that, to uh, look like civilian clothing. And I had a friend of mine uh, Prozac, uh, who was an illustrator in New York, and he spent his most time mostly making identification cards and so forth. With a pen and India ink, 
he could make a, an identification card that you'd swear was printed. The, the only ones that did get out never got very far, and they got out by subterfuge, going out with foodstuffs and uh, camps that were bringing in things, and uh, they never got very far. Usually they would be punished by put in, in solitary, and they also would deny them any cigarettes. And they said it was like a vacation to get out of a 20-man room to a one in solitude. They, they would take that any time. As to labor, they couldn't use an officer for labor other than his own. We did a lot of growing of vegetables and uh, a lot of staging of plays and musicals and so forth. And uh, under the Geneva Convention, the Germans were obliged to give us as much food as they would to the ordinary German soldier. But because we got these Red Cross parcels, one per week per uh, prisoner that had a lot of things in it, uh, corned beef and uh, margarine and clim, which was a powdered milk, and all kinds of things. And the cigarettes too, usually a package of about five uh, packs of cigarettes. And uh, we would use them for trading, not only to other prisoners, but also with guards and so forth. And uh, once you get a guard to start trading, you get them over the barrel from then on. You can threaten them and get them to bring. They even brought uh, radio tubes and things like that. One brought a gun in to us, but it wasn't useful, it was a rusty old thing. We had some, some of the raids towards the end of the war came right overhead and uh, we'd get out there clapping and yelling and the Germans took exception to that and, and passed an order that uh, we would have to go back in and stay in until the all clear came. And we had one POW that uh, was killed because of that. He, uh, he had been playing games chess or checkers or something. And the, the raid uh, went on and on and on, and he forgot that and went out to an outdoor at a latrine. And uh, he got out uh, the door and realized that no one was out there. So he turned around, tried to make it back in, but he didn't make it quick enough. He got killed. Most of them were roving guards uh, during the day sneaking around, making sure we weren't trying to escape. And, uh, and, and at night, after they closed the shutters to keep the lights from shining out, the, uh, the guards roving then would have a dog for each one of them. They usually were German shepherds, and we expected they were pretty ferocious. One of the guards uh, picked up his uh, dog and threw him in the window, and he went around sniffing to each one of the POWs that was in the bottom bunk. He was a friendly dog, <laughs> but he wouldn't have been friendly if we were outside. We had guard towers every corner. Yeah. They would even shoot at you if you went across these guard wires about 30 feet in from the guard towers on the, in the main fencing. We had a lot of sports while we were in uh, camp, uh, a lot of baseball and uh, rugby. And every evening we'd go out for exercise marching around and a lot of the sand and, and earth that we got from our tunnels 
we would put in bags down our inside of our leg of our trousers and spill that out as we marched around. Oh, the Germans uh, decided to abandon the camp and withdraw to the west. And when they talked to our senior Allied commander, he was empty. He said, no way you're going to move them. Uh, our people will stay right here. And the German uh, accepted that. And they went by themselves. One night they pulled out. When we got up in the morning, the guard towers were all deserted and uh, there were no guards around and no Germans around. So we knocked down a lot of our fences and, and manned the towers to warn of any approaching personnel. And we sent uh, a vehicle out with a couple of high ranking uh, American pilots to see if they could contact the Russians and warn them that we were there. And about two days later, one of the majors came back with a Russian officer and uh, we were officially liberated. And uh, Colonel Hubert Zemke was our senior allied officer for the whole camp. And he was told by the Russians that their orders, this Marshal Rogoszowski, had uh, orders to uh, send us down to the Black Sea, down by the Dardanelles, where the Liberty ships were coming up and bringing in supplies to Russian ports there. And we'd have had to walk all the way down to the Black Sea because there was no transportation available at that time. So Zemke talked to, the, to uh, Marshal Rogostovsky and got him to uh, request a change of his orders to allow us to land uh, planes at the Bath Airport, which was very close to where we were housed. and. Uh, he finally got uh, the approval and we cleaned up uh, wreckage and so forth so they could use the runway. They would land and without shutting down engines, taxi back on a parallel taxiway and stop just long enough to put about 30 Kriegis or prisoners in each plane and they would fly us from there to Reims, France, to an American B-26 flying base. And we were given new uniforms there and deloused with DDT. And uh, the next day we were taken by C-47s to a staging camp on the shores uh, of France uh, this was called Lucky Strike they had three or four of them named for different cigarettes I was there about three weeks and would see B-17s come in land on this these temporary runways of steel matting and it always seemed like there were more went out on it that came in. And so I started inquiring and uh, found I could get a set of orders for leave in England. So I got a, the set of orders and got a, on a plane and lo and behold, they took me back to my original base at Bury St. Edmunds. After staying there one night, I hot-footed it down by train and so forth 
to Grosvenor Square in London and reported in ready to go home anytime. And they told me that the orders were illegal and we'd probably have to go back to Camp Lucky Strike. And later that morning, I was sitting in the same big room there with lots of other uh, XPOWs, and they announced to us that we would not have to go back because there were so many people on these orders. From there, we went to uh, a coast, southern coast of England, to, uh, can't think of the name of it, Port now, and waited there about three weeks and boarded ship for a shipment home in a uh, LST, uh, a 30 ship convoy. We were 19 days coming across, mainly because there was a hurricane or threat of hurricane around uh, uh, north of Puerto Rico and headed for Bermuda. So we steamed directly south for two full days before we could return to our course in Virginia. When we landed down there, I got outside of orders and went by train to Massachusetts. By that time, my folks had moved to Buzzards Bay on Cape Cod, and I ended up reporting home. For the first time, I saw my, my mother for three years. They had moved down uh, while my brother and I were in the service. And uh, my brother by that time was stationed at uh, Camp Edwards on Cape Cod, adjacent to Otis Air Force Base. And uh, strangely enough, I played golf there shortly after I got to Cape Cod and uh, ran into some German POWs who were taking care of the course there. I had a leave of 30 days. Then I had to report to Atlantic City for a, a refreshing uh, of records. They had lost all records. They had to take our word for a lot of it. And we spent a lot of many days uh, building up a, a file, two horn file. And uh, from there, I went to uh, refresher pilot training at Turner Field in Albany, Georgia, where I flew B-25s. And I got an instructor rating down there. And uh, well, that was there maybe two or three months. And I went to uh, Columbus, Mississippi, and then from there to Wright-Patterson, and while I was at Wright-Patterson, they circulated a form you could request what your preference would be for a base. And I replied that I'd like to be at Hanscom Field. So I was shipped to Hanscom Field. And they had so many pilots staying in at that time, they had to uh, spread them out into other MOSs, military occupation specialty. And when I got to Hanscom Field, I was informed for the first time that I was a supply officer. But I kept the instructor pilot as a secondary MOS, so it was all right with me. And uh, one of the girls that worked at supply under me later became my wife. And uh, 
she had become uh, acquainted with some of the uh, National Guard pilots that had been pilots before uh, World War II, pilots before the war, uh, between the wars. And uh, one of them asked one day whether she would like to move to Northampton uh, or Westfield. And uh, she said be okay with her. So that's where we went as soon as we were off our honeymoon. And I went to work for the Air National Guard there as supply officer first. Nine months later, I moved to Logan as base operations officer and squadron operations officer. Squadron operations part-time, base operations 40 hour week, civilian employee. Well, I met some wonderful people and uh, the associations, probably that's the biggest part of it. I'd done an awful lot of flying. Uh, looking back at it afterwards, you realize that there was a lot of risk there. But uh, I, don't, I don't think at the time we concentrated on that much. I don't think we realized at that point what a contribution my, uh, my uh, age bracket was going undergoing.